Bill, certainly there are times in our life when we need the Lord to wrap us in his arms and hold us up. Amen. Amen. Beautiful song. Thank you, Miss Hannah. You can take your Bibles this morning if you like and turn with me to Matthew 17. Matthew 16, I'm sorry. We'll get it straight in a minute. Matthew 16 this morning. I'm so glad to see you today. And uh, we are stronger together. Amen. I love it when we come together because, because I need you, you need me, we need each other. We talked about how important it is that we come together because of the fact that we need the fellowship, we need the encouragement. Right. And uh, we need God to meet with us. This is God's house. Amen. Turn this thing on, brother. All right. This is God's house. Amen. I was glad, David said, when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. I'm always glad. I was thinking 43 and a half years ago, uh, I gave my heart to the Lord. And not long after that, God called me into the ministry. And so almost every Sunday for 43 and a half years, I've been in the house of the Lord. And I love being in the house of God. Amen. I do. I truly do. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. If that's all I get to do someday, if I lose my facilities, my faculties, rather, my mind or whatever, I, I wouldn't mind if I could just at least open the door for folks and say, hey, come Amen. on. Amen. Come Amen. into the house of God. Amen. Some folks think I'm already there, but there's a lot of discussion these days about what is real and what is fake. On one side, you have real news. On another side, you have fake news. Some would say that we're in a real pandemic, while others would say that we're in a fake pandemic, Amen. a sham demic. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Some would say that we're maybe getting the real numbers of the COVID deaths, and there are those who would say, well, we're not, we're getting fake numbers. Amen. Some would say that uh, we have a real president in the, uh, in the Oval Office, and some would say, well, we got a pretend president, a fake president. Some are praying and hoping, as I am, that we have a real election in the Amen. Amen. <laughs> and not a rigged election. Amen. We hope that, uh, that it happens and happens quickly. I mean, if you're going to pull the Band-Aid off, do it quickly, but let's, I hope we keep the Band-Aid on. There is a lot of division right. over what is real and what is fake. Right. And I don't know about you, but it worries me as I see our country being divided Amen. greater and greater. The, yeah. the gap getting wider and wider. And it just seems like it's an impossible uh, span to breach yeah. between what is real and what is fake. And, and so this has caused a disturbance in our country because the honest truth is it's just plain hard to determine if you're getting it right. Amen. If the information is true, if, if, if it's fake or if it's real. Today I want to turn our attention to really the only place that we have to go in a world where there's so many variables and so many questions and that my friend is the word of God Amen. and and I want to ask the question this morning what is a real church what is a today is back to church Sunday what is a real church in theological circles you would uh, the question would would be asked like this what is a true church and what is a false church church. So today we want to look at those, those two things. And I'm, I'm reminded, uh, you hear this so often said, people say, well, if you're going to go to church, attend the church of your choice. <coughs> and I say to you this morning that we ought to attend the church of God's choice. Amen. Amen. That's right. Figure out where God is and where God's word is being preached. There's really only two options. You either attend a church that's been birthed by God, or you attend a church that's been brokered by man. Yeah, right. 
You either attend a church that believes the Word of God as it is, infallible, inspired, or you follow and attend a church that doesn't believe that. You either attend a church that's going to show you the true way to heaven, or you're going to attend a church that's going to basically send your soul to hell. And that makes the world a difference. Amen. And I've heard it said, and I like it, but it really does matter what you believe. Amen. It really does. Someone has once said, you're only living what you're believing. And this is true. And so doctrine is important. And therefore, church is important because remember the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 3.15 that the house of God, which is the church of the living God, is the pillar and ground of the truth. This is ground zero for truth. The church. A real church. And I have to believe we have a real church. The very first mention of the word church in the Bible is found in chapter 16 of Matthew and it comes from the lips of our Lord. Follow with me as I read verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said thou art the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him blessed art thou Simon Barjona for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee but my father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Father, I ask this morning that you bless the reading of thy word and the preaching of thy word. I pray for your power this morning and your anointing upon everything that I say, that I might say exactly what you'd had me to say and nothing more. God, I pray that my, what I say would be both practical and palatable, that God's people might be able to receive it. I know we have folks this morning that are young in the Lord. We have folks that have been in the Lord for the long time. But yet, Lord, I need to be able to reach both ends of the spectrum. I need to say what every heart needs this morning. So give me that, Lord. I pray today again that you might reach not just our minds, but our hearts. And if there's one today without Christ, that they might be saved. So Lord, help us to understand today what it is to have a real church. And I ask it in Christ's name, amen and amen. I remember 10, and, uh, uh, 10 years, a little 10 years ago when I came to Southwest Baptist Church and the very first Sunday that I preached to you, and many of you were here, um, that Sunday evening as I was preaching in view of a call, I preached a message on the church. It was the message I preached many times called what, uh, or called uh, 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 what every church, I get it, what every church was meant to be out of Acts chapter 2. I almost wanted to preach that again this morning, but the Lord led me in this direction. Here we have the very first time that the word church is used here and in the Bible, and it's used by the Lord Jesus Christ. The word church in the Greek, and you remember and know that the church or that the Greek is the, the language of the New Testament. In the Greek, the word is really two words. It is the word ek, which means out, and is the word plesia, which means to call. So you have these two words put together, and it would be literally an out called assembly, or we might in better English, say a called out uh, assembly. A called out assembly. You say, preacher, when that happened, that happened in Matthew chapter 10 when Jesus was on the side of the mountain and he had his disciples in front of him. And I'm talking about more than just the 12. But many folks were following Jesus. And that day in Matthew 10, he called out 12 men. These 12 men constituted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church that Jesus would pastor. That church would eventually become the church at Jerusalem, from which other churches like the church in Antioch would be established. So we have the church started by Jesus. Amen. By Jesus. And we'll get more to that, into more of that in just a moment. But notice in what we just read, in verse 18, Jesus makes reference to a rock. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Well, Peter's name, name means a little stone. 
And so Jesus is making a comparison and saying that, Peter, uh, you're a little stone, but there is a greater stone upon which I'm going to build my church. The Catholics have it wrong. Jesus didn't build his church on Peter. Right. And uh, Francis, that's up there right now, now is not a, a descendant of Peter, uh, and he's not the vicar of Christ either. But the fact is, the church was established on what they say was Jesus' words upon Peter. Uh, but that's not the case. In my Bible, as you may also do, or maybe you've already done, uh, the words this rock, you could cir circle that phrase and draw an arrow up to verse 16 to that phrase, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because there's the parallel. What, what is the church Jesus is talking about? What is it uh, based upon? What is it founded upon? What is the rock that it's built upon? It's built upon that doctrine that Jesus is the Christ, Amen. the Son of the living God. Amen. This is what constitutes the, the foundation of any real Christian church. And so doctrine is important. It is doctrine that will tell you about a church. Amen. You cannot separate the two, although we see that being done all around us. Most people, when they're out church shopping, and you've got to admit, people just church shopping today, you know? Right. And so they'll get a little piece of this church over there. Maybe they'll go to Sunday school over here. Then they'll go to church over there. They'll go to a small Bible study over there. And a small group. And then they'll do this and they'll do that. And they kind of piece it all together. And they're not committed anywhere. But they're just church shopping. Church hopping, if you would. Shopping. Um, you remember when uh, you was young and poor? Couples. And you'd go window shopping. You remember that? You wasn't there to buy nothing, but you was acting like it. Remember those days? Y'all never did this? Yes. Going to a store, you know, acting like, you know, yeah, you know, I got lots of green in my billfold, but you ain't got nothing green in your billfold, man. You might have two coins to, but anyway, you're in there window shopping. A lot of people window shopping. And as they window shop, they're looking for things like music, you know. Do you got a band? Do you got a, you know, a praise team? Or maybe they're looking for a, a, a good team program, and, 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 and in their definition is, uh, do you go skiing and, and, you know, in the Alps, and do you take mission trips to Hawaii, you know, uh, that kind of stuff, you know, for the teenagers, you know. Uh, that's what they're looking for. Or what about uh, you got you got anything like a ballpark and a ball team, you know? And and uh, do you got a bowling alley? Do you you know? I knew one church, honestly, honestly, I knew a church, and you can look this up. Uh, they had uh, they had a swimming pool in their church, and they had a big slide that you could slide down in the middle of the church to the swimming pool. But anyway, uh, just trying any way to get people's attention to get them in, because people are not spiritually discerned. They're lost, right. for the most part, right. and carnal at best. And so they're not looking for the right things. Right. It's kind of like the, the modern preacher that would get up and say, is everybody happy? You know, and we're looking for new ways to be relevant in our culture, and it's all predicated on entertainment. Well, doctrine is not always entertaining. But it's essential to a real church. Amen. The one thing that every church, every, if you go looking for a church, the, one of the first questions you are to ask is, are they biblically sound? Amen. Whether they got a swimming pool or a bowling alley or a tennis court or a ball team or a music program or if a nursery, even if they don't have a nursery. First church I pastored didn't have a nursery. They didn't want a nursery. I had to out-preach them little knuckleheads. <laughs> but they're not looking necessarily for a church that is gathered around and based on the Word of God. That, that right. doesn't interest right. them so very much. But can I tell you something? That's where I believe the rubber hits the road when it comes to your testimony. If you're really going to say you're a Christian, you ought to have a love for truth. Amen. Amen. 
You ought to have a love for the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Like, nobody ought to twist your arm to make you want to read the Bible. Amen. You're as good a Christian as you want to be, and I'm telling you, if you want to read the Bible and understand about so well, I don't understand all of these and thous. Thee is me, friend. Thou is you. There you go. <laughs> hey. I, I, I don't, it's all this so hard. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, you you get on your face before the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. Amen. He's the one who helped me in writing to begin with. Right. The holy men of old were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Wrote the Word of God. In, so God can move you to understand it too. That's right. But you ought not have to be have your arm twisted to read the Word of God and to love the Word of God. And if we cancel every other ministry in this church, as long as we stay with the teaching and the preaching of God's Word, we're going to be okay. Amen. 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 Most everything else is just fluffing stuff. This is what is essential. The Word of God. And so that's what the Lord is teaching us in the very first time that He uses the word church. I love the church. Amen. I know, I know you pay me to be here, but I love it. Amen. I love it. I mean, I come up here sometimes and ain't nobody else around. I just love coming in and walking around and touching things and praying over stuff. I'm not being super pious. I just love the church. Amen. I remember when I first got saved, my home was a disaster. I was living with my dad in an upstairs garage apartment on the south side of Kilgore called Little Mexico. We had nothing, but I was a long-haired hippie, and, but the Lord saved me, and, and I just fell in love with church. I wanted Amen. to be there all the time. Amen. I mean, you didn't have to beg me to come to church. I was begging the preacher, would you please do something? I, he said, well, listen, it's Thursday morning at 3, and, you know, at, at 5 o'clock in the morning. Let's open the doors and do something. That was me, you know. I want to I go to church. Amen. I was involved in everything because I love the church. Amen. I loved it. Did you know God loves his church? Amen. Amen. The Bible says he gave himself for it. Amen. What? The church. That's why Jesus died, that he might establish the church. That's important to you and I because, friend, I don't know how you can be a Christian without the church. I don't know how you can grow in the Lord without the church. I don't know how you can run a family without the church. I don't know how you can be the, the, the Christian uh, patriot and a, a citizen that you need to be without the church. Amen. Everything. This ought to be a hub, a hub. Three institutions God ordained. And the first was the home, the second the state, the third the church. But that church ought to be a hub Amen. of activity in your life. Now, how do you determine what is a real church? Because this morning I'm concerned about that. I want folks to be in a real church. Amen. <laughs> I'm all the time, I'm like, I probably shouldn't use this word, but the word, you, you heard the word, people talk about trolling. Online, I don't know if, that, if I'm a troll or not, but I like to get online and go to these other churches' websites and just see what's going on, you know. And I and I, I come across one that well, this this morning I was just had just happened to be anyway. And I come across one, and this guy he, he gets up and he's of course a young man. It's always a young man, okay, that hadn't learned how to shave yet. You know, he just got the little stubble everywhere. And uh, that was funny. But anyway, and so he's always young. He's got a T-shirt on this morning. Of course, his old ragged jeans and flip-flops. And, uh, and, uh, and his T-shirt, it was a Beatles T-shirt. A Beatles T-shirt. Beatles. It was their Sergeant Pepper. Pepper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. This was, I said that, I couldn't even remember. Sergeant Pepper. Sure. You know, have Alistair Crowley on there and all that bunch, you know. And he's wearing that shirt while he's preaching. And I thought, my soul, how far we come in America that anything goes so long as we just say we're a church. Yeah. Well, that's not biblical. I want to know what is biblical when it comes to a real church. Let me give you some things this morning. First of all, a real church has a real beginning. Amen. Amen. Or we might put it this way, a real birth. We had a new baby born into our family. 
and new grandbaby recently, a little over a month old now, a little Levi Judah, uh, Jude, Levi Jude is, uh, is, is just, I love that kid and I'm excited about him. But he was born. Amen. He wasn't manufactured. He wasn't made in China. He wasn't brokered. He wasn't purchased. He was born Amen. into the family. He was born into the family. And so, so it is with a real church. You know why? Because a real church is not an organization. That's right. A real church is an organism. Amen. Are you still with me? Amen. It requires a birth. That's why I'm more prone to say when we celebrate our anniversary, I'm more prone to say it's our birthday because 55 and some months ago, uh, years ago, we were... We were born. Amen. Southwest Baptist Church Amen. was born. It has a real beginning. Amen. I mean, if, you, if somebody says, well, I'm not too sure about you. Are you real? Well, what do you do? I'll show you I'm real. You produce a birth certificate. Here's my birth certificate. I want to, you go get your license. You got to do business with the government. They got to prove if you're real. Now, here's my birth certificate. And that's proof of your validity, of your being born. And so on, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus birthed his church with those 12 men and brought them together, called them unto himself, and they became the church of, of Jesus. Amen. That church would later become the church at Jerusalem. Well, I hear people say, well, preacher, I thought a Baptist, or I, brother, I thought a church was born on Pentecost. I thought that was the day of the birth of the church. Well, uh, I'm sorry to tell you, friend, but that's not correct. That's not correct. Nobody, 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 Jesus didn't stand out in the middle of Jerusalem that day and call out his church. On that day, something very particular and very specific happened to the church. Right. A church that was already established. And the Lord added to the church. Amen. The church that was already established. 3,000 people were added, and on the day of Pentecost was the day when God empowered his church. Amen. Empowered. The Holy Spirit came and gave them the power to be bold, and they turned Jerusalem upside down. So it was a day when the Holy Spirit gave them power to preach and power to be the church. A lot of people say about the Baptist movement, Baptist, you know, they say, well, Weren't y'all just a part of the Reformation like everybody again, uh, uh, like everybody else? Well, again, you're wrong. You're wrong. We were not a part of the Reformation movement. The Reform yeah. Reformation movement was all about those people rebelling, uh, uh, or, or, or the Protestants protesting against the Catholic Church. We've always protested against the Catholic Amen. Church. Amen. I'm not trying to be mean. I love. There are certain Catholics that I know that I love them to death. But the fact is that the Catholic Church was not birthed by God. It was brokered by man. Right. And it was it is not a real church. And that church would have and our and God's people never accepted it, never did. Right. And we were always outside of it. So we weren't a part of what is called the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. So if somebody asks you on a piece of paper, you know, you go into the hospital and they ask the, the normal questions, you know, like, are you a gun owner? How many guns do you have in your house? Man, what does that got to do with health care? Anyway, um, you know, but they ask the normal questions. And church affiliates, they'll say, a Catholic, a Protestant, or other. I put Baptist. Amen. See? Uh, because we were birthed in by God. And uh, Jesus put it together. Again, remember this. Baptist is not a denomination. A true Baptist is not. When I say Baptist, I'm not talking about a denomination. Yeah. Amen. We are non-denominational. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. God never created a denomination. Baptist refers to doctrine. That's right. Amen. Always. I'm a Baptist preacher. Why? Because there are certain doctrines, Baptist doctrines, that I hold to. to Amen. I hold to, I hold to in truth. Uh, there, there, there are doctrines like uh, the, uh, uh, the Trinity. Uh, doctrines like salvation by grace through faith, uh, the local church, uh, all of these, there are certain fundamentals, if you would. Amen? Amen. So what Jesus started 
in Matthew chapter 10 was an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, local, visible, evangelical church. Amen. Conservative. Jesus, that's the kind of church Jesus started. That's the kind of church that is a real church. Amen. Amen. Well, I tell you, I wish people weren't so blind and, 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 and weren't so caught up into in emotionalism and, and all of these things, sensationalism, and just would get back to what, just get back to truth. Amen. Amen. Now look, I, I'm a compassionate preacher, I think I am, but I have some convictions. And it's it, in, in all times I find myself battling between the two, compassion and conviction, but I believe you can have both. I don't hate people. I love people. I want them to be saved. Amen. But I can tell you this right now. I hate the world. All oh, the world. I dislike the world. Amen. Amen. Now, it, another thing about this birth, and right quick, I, I feel like I'm going to be long this morning, but another thing about this birth. In order to have a church birth, you've got to have a mama. You've got to have a mama. All right? I wonder how many of you know that, that, that our church has a mother church. Our mother church is, is Tabernacle Baptist Church in Roswell, New Mexico. Some people don't even realize that. Maybe you've been here for years and never realized that we have a mother church. As I said before, the church of Jerusalem uh, was persecuted. They split apart and became the mother, the mother church of the church of Antioch in Syria. And other churches, every church that Paul planted was under the authority of, the, of his mother church or his church, which was the church in Antioch in Syria. Are you still with me? Amen. When they had problems, I think in Acts 15 or so, they went back to mama church right. and had a meeting about it and discussed it. And so every church has a mother church. Now, why is that so important? Because... You can't just show up one day and say, well, I think I'll start a church. Right. Yeah. Nobody likes me over there, and I don't like that one over there, and I think I just want to start a church. And so let's broker a deal. Can I rent that? How much? Hey, how folks come on in here? Get, got a guitar? You got a guitar? You got a drum set? Let's pull it together, man. Let's have church. That ain't the way that works. Right. Yeah. Over 55 years ago, a man came who was ordained out of Roswell, New Mexico Church. And he was sent out of that church and started a church here. Amen. And that church was birthed. And so we, you, in order to have a real church, you've got to have a real birth. Second of all, you've got to have a real body. That's right. A real body. Now, what is the body? Well, the church is the body. The body is the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can look this up later, verses 12 through 25, Paul talked about the body being many members, yet one body. There are many folks in this room this morning. We're all different in personality. We're all different in looks. We have different habits. We have different wits. We have different uh, skin tones. We have different cultural backgrounds. We have different names. But, but when we come together, uh, we are one body. Amen. I love it when I hear people say, and it just flies in the face of the leftist of our day. It's not... Black America, Spanish America, Latino America, Asian American. It's just American. Amen. 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 It's just American. We're just Americans. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. And when it comes to the house of God, we come together. You just check yourself at the door. You're nobody any better than anybody else here. We're none of us. Amen. I don't care how, how much money you can jingle in your pocket. How much education you got. We're all the same. We're just all one body. And we have different functions. One may be a hand. One may be a foot. One may be a mouth. One may be a nose. Somebody might be the gallbladder. Whatever it does. <laughs> Amen. The appendix. I would hate to know I was just the appendix. <laughs> but I guess it serves a purpose or it wouldn't be there. Right. Somebody might be uh, in, in the limelight. Gets... Somebody might be the mouth, and the mouth is heard, and everybody, but somebody's got to be the lung, somebody's got to be the kidney. That's right. Amen. Amen. Somebody's got to be the colon. God help you. 
But we, everybody's got to be some, And it's a body when we come together. And that's what the Lord is saying. A real church, everybody works together. We cooperate together. We don't compete against one another. We complete each other. Amen. A real body. A real body. And that's what I love about the church. And that's what I'm I'm just despising right now with all that's going on. It just seems like now we just are able to just do so much. We can just push so far and everybody's not getting to exercise their gifts. <coughs> and I don't like that. I want to get back to it where everybody has a place and a spot doing what God put you here to do in the body. Amen. So a real church is, has a real birth. There's so much more I want to say. A real church has a real body. Number three, a real church has a real bishop. <laughs> Sometimes the word elder is used for pastor in the church. But for some odd reason, I just like that name, bishop. <laughs> Paul told Timothy in Titus 1 verse 5, For this cause let thy... Be in Crete that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. So every real church has a real pastor who has been ordained by a church, right. a, a church, a real church who has gathered around them and placed their hands upon him and ordained him. I was ordained. At Faith Baptist Church in Greenville, Mississippi, in 1986, I think it was. Amen. And uh, my pastor at that time, Brother Ed Decker, and other men of the church, as well as the deacons of that church, gathered around me as I knelt at the altar. And they put their hands upon me, and they prayed over me, and they ordained me into the gospel ministry. Amen. And so uh, I became a, a, a man of God, a pastor, ready to pastor. And every real church has a real pastor, someone whose God has touched. How many times have I heard people say this? Well, it don't matter what man thinks. God's ordained me. I don't need man's ordination. Now, that all sounds good and pious, but that's not biblical. Right. The Holy Ghost told the church in Acts 13, separate me. Separate unto me Barnabas and, and, and Paul. And they did, and they ordained them, they laid hands on them and ordained them into the gospel ministry and they went forth as missionaries out of that church. That is the way God put it together. That's biblical. Amen. That's biblical. I believe this whole world is full of men and ladies who have been appointed as a pastor but not anointed by the Lord. And no, no, God has never called a woman to, to be a pastor. I'm sorry. Amen. It's not in there. Amen. It's not in there. Amen. The husband of one wife, well, these days, you know, but still, no. Amen. God ordained it that man should be a pastor. So, uh, boy, it was kind of quiet there. I don't know what's going on. A real church has a real birth. A real church has a real body. A real church has a real bishop. Number four, a real church has a real baptism. A real baptism. Amen. You told I, I've told you the story how a guy came to the pastor, a preacher came to, to be a guest speaker at a church, and he was he was about to preach, and he reached down, he grabbed the glass of water there on the pulpit, and took a big swig of it, and everybody in the church just went. <gasps> now he didn't realize it till later. He had just drunk the baptistry. <laughs> they was a sprinkling church. And so people come forward to get sprinkled. Ain't no sprinkling in the Bible. Ain't no sprinkling. The Bible says Jesus went down into the river. Down into the water. And John baptized him. Yeah. And, and, and I've seen some preachers. And I'm not. This is just bishopology here. But forgive me. But I've seen them baptize them face forward. You know. I don't think they're going to bury me in a coffin face forward. <laughs> so we baptize them backside down into the water. You know, with their hands crossed, they're, getting, they're dying to the old life. That's right. Being raised to walk in newness of life. A real baptism. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's true baptism. And let me say something. 
that to me is very important and very controversial, and that's all right, but I believe with all my heart, faith brings you into the family of God. Amen. But baptism brings you into the body of Christ. Amen. When you follow the Lord in that first step of obedience and you follow the Lord in believer's baptism, you are saying to everybody that now I'm being baptized into this local body. This is my church. This is where I belong. I can't just... I, you know, I've had, I remember one time I was in tour and, and I came, a man knocked on my door. I was in, I was in a little storefront and a uh, man knocked on the door and asked me, he said, I'm going to come to your church. I said, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you come to our church. He said, yep, I'm going to be your next deacon. <laughs> I said, is that right? He said, oh, yeah. I said, man, look, I, I'm ordained. He said, I got my ordination. Look, deacon ordained. I was ordained a deacon. So if I come to church, I'll be one of, uh, of your deacons. I said, no, you won't. <laughs> I got enough trouble. <laughs> Amen. No, you won't. I didn't ordain you. You can't just take that ordination, go from here to here to young, and just, just jump in on a particular church and say, hey, we're all a part of the body of Christ. I'm coming to play my part here. Listen, that's not what God put in order when he put together the local church. A, a church is a local, visible, autonomous church. Uh, uh, church. It's a place where this body of believers works together. And it's not my place to tell Anchor Baptist Church what to do. It's not Anchor's church to tell me what to do. I'm, I'm not at liberty to tell Liberty what to do. And Liberty ain't liber at liberty to tell us what to do. Amen. And no no, no regional or quarter uh, master whoever he is is going to tell us what to do. We govern ourselves. Amen. And that's exactly the way the Lord intended it for it to be. Amen. In fact, the scripture we just read, if you want to just quick, quickly note this, verse 19, after he said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, and he says, and I will give unto thee, talking to the church, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou, uh, thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind, Loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's basically giving authority, autonomous authority, to every church to govern themselves. Amen. So a real church has a real birth, has a real body, has a real bishop, has a real baptism. Also, a real church has a real Bible. Amen. A real Bible. It's getting thick, isn't it? It's, it's getting a little thicker here, isn't it? Now, I know, I know there's so many in our world today, well, it just doesn't matter as long as you've got something that's called a Bible. It does matter. Amen. Amen. It does matter. Amen. Fact is that God wrote a book. He gave it to men, uh, about 40 authors over the span of 20-something hundred years. And he gave these, these men and women, and, and, and well, men, holy men of God, were moved of the Holy Ghost, wrote it down. God said, you write it, and wrote it down. And they passed that along from generation to generation. The Bible talks about that he would do just that. He would preserve it from generation to Amen. generation. So not only do we believe in divine inspiration of the Scripture, we believe in divine preservation of the Scripture. And we don't have time to go into all this this morning, but there is no doubt in my mind that the King James Bible is the Bible Amen. of our generation. Amen. Amen. It is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It comes from the right source, right, which is Antioch of Syria, not Alexandria, Egypt. Right. And there's a difference. If you've right. done any study, you'll realize this. It's got the right manuscripts, the received text. It's not built on Westcott or Hort or any of the Catholic corrupted texts. It is the Word of God. That's Amen. why you'll still find 1 John 5, 7 in there where it says there are three in heaven that bear witness of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So to have the right Bible is important because if you've got the wrong Bible, you're going to end up with the wrong doctrine. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And again, you've got to have the right doctrine. Doctrine is important. I need to know what the Bible teaches about the Trinity of God. Did you know that just about every Bible in America today, every modern version, if you look at it, study it, 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 it always attacks the deity of Christ. That's number one. It always attacks the deity of Christ. It attacks salvation by grace. I need to know the truth about these things. 
a real Bible will teach you about the Trinity of God, about the deity of Christ, about the reality of heaven and hell, about the authority of the church. A real Bible will teach you the separation of church and state. A real Bible will teach you about the eternal security of the believer. A real Bible will teach you about salvation by grace through faith. A real, a real Bible will teach you about the literal second coming of Christ. A real Bible will teach you about the rapture. A real Bible will teach you the truth. And Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. A real Christian, a real church has a real birth, a real body, a real bishop, a real baptism, a real Bible. Let's go with another B. Uh, a real church has a real battle. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hell is our enemy. Hell is our enemy. I don't want you to go to hell. And I don't want you to live in hell. I don't want your life to be like hell on earth. And I'll tell you something this morning. You go your way, and there's only one way to go. There is a way that seemeth right of the man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Right. Death. You take any way you want to on this earth, plan it out the best you can, get you a financial planner, get you uh, some, some CDs and get you a savings account and get you an, a retirement account. You can go through all this process and make sure everything's good and you can still end up wrong. And in hell. fact is, all the forces of hell are against an old-fashioned, independent, fundamental Baptist church. Not only is our battle against the devil and against hell, it's also against liberalism and ecumenicalism and socialism and Marxism and communism. Amen. And that's the battle we're fighting today, by the way. If you, if you can figure this out yet. <coughs> BLM is a Marxist organization. Amen. 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 Sure. Planned Parenthood started by racist. Trying to stop the black population. Do your homework. Amen. Look into these things. Antifa, all these organizations that are causing division in our country today, my friend, uh, these are things that we're battling, and 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 really, it has to it has to be established in the church. Amen. 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 What we, what we're doing, how we battle these things. Jude three talks about that we're to earnestly contend. For the faith, Amen. once delivered to the saints, that's our job. Amen. We're to defend that faith. Oh, man, we're going to have a good time when I talk about how a Christian ought to vote. <laughs> Coming up soon, we're going to have a good time. But really, it's a no-brainer. Amen. It's a no-brainer. You ready? Here's the answer. Bible on this side, no Bible on that side. Now, you figure out which side is which, okay? Now, a real battle, we're in the battle of our lives. And let me say this, and this is last. A real church has a real burden. What's the burden? God wants us to be soul winners. He wants, to win, he wants us to win the world. Hey, can I say that one of the reasons we're in such a mess in our, in our country, and, I, and this is going to, and I'm sorry to have to say it, Part of it is our fault. Right, right. Amen. We can't just wash our hands and say we had nothing to do with it. That's true. Somewhere we missed raising a generation of young people right. to be responsible. Right. Yeah. Amen. Right. I'm looking at people in this church. You've got kids, and I'll tell you what, some of you got some of the most responsible kids out there. You took time. You made that happen. You trained them. Amen. They turned out. Yeah. But a child left to himself. Right. Bringeth his mother to shame and everybody else. Right. It's a shameful thing. But we've raised a generation that is just had, that has no responsibility. They, they they want a free meal ticket. Right. Right. They want they want everything given to them. They're not givers. They're takers. That's right. That's right. And it's a sad situation. But some of those kids could have gone to Sunday school. But mama didn't take them and daddy didn't take them. Some of those kids could have, could have gone to a Christian school. 
But that's, we're not going to do that. Some of those kids could have had a family altar at home, but no, we're too busy for a family altar. You see where I'm getting at? Amen. Uh, well, I know everybody got up late this morning. We're all tired. We had a rough day yesterday. We're just not going to church today, kids. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Miss church. Kids grow up thinking that it's optional. Yeah. When what we should have been doing was stressing the fact you've got, you got to go to church. You've got to teach them children the word of God. You've got to train them in the ways of the Lord. Train them a child in the way should go when he's old and not depart from it. We're to teach them about, about Jesus. Amen. Amen. Teach them about salvation. Teach them about heaven and hell. Amen. That's our burden. Paul said it like this in Romans 10. 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You want to know how, how much Paul loved his nation? That in one place, I don't have it wrote down, in one place he went to God and he said, God, if you would just blot me out, I, I would go to hell. I'd be a curse if you could just help my people be saved. Amen. Amen. Well, that's something else, isn't it? You remember when God one day looked at Moses and said, Moses, Stand to one side. I'm going to kill every one of them. We're going to start over. And Moses got back in the face of God and said, Don't do this, God. Just wipe me out. But don't do that. Don't wipe out your people. And he prayed for the people and, they, and, and God spared that judgment. That's, right. That's where we're at today. Amen. The fact is, we have a burden on our hearts. The burden of a real church is to reach real people with a real gospel so that they might have a real change in their life. People need real salvation. Not this business of coming down and shaking the preacher's hand and walking away thinking you got saved. And by the way, salvation is a two-sided coin. And one side of the coin is repentance. Yeah. The other side is faith. I've got to repent. I don't come down just looking for an insurance policy. Right. Make a deal with God. Say, well, okay, God. I'll quit my smoking if you let me go to heaven. Don't work like that. You come down and say, God, I'm a miserable, horrible, vicious, mean, malicious, envious, jealous, dirty, filthy, Wicked man. Amen. Amen. When I lead somebody to Christ, I always say, if you don't want to pray, let me pray a prayer and you repeat it after me. And I always, here's the prayer I pray. Dear God, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. More than once I've had somebody say, what? <laughs> yes, you deserve to go to hell. Yeah. How can you be saved until first you know that you're a sinner? And that's where repentance comes in. Amen. A real burden. My burden is, as a church, as a pastor, our burden is to reach people for the Lord. That's why we preach the truth. That's why we want to reopen this thing again. That's Amen. why we want to see the ministry started up again. And listen, by the way, this just got into my mind, and, and I wanted to say it earlier, but I don't say it now. Pray for our nursing homes. I've heard story after story after story of, 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 a, of a family who wanted to see their loved one before they passed and wasn't able to see their loved one, wasn't able to be there to hold their hand as they passed. That's, that's so sad. Right. So sad. And now, you know, they're making, you can sit in an open area, maybe a little, but you still can't touch them. Sad. Amen. Bless their hearts. That breaks my heart, but it also breaks my heart to think that Sometime, maybe today, we're going to hear a shout. Amen. And, and the Lord's going to say, come on up here. Meet me in the air. Amen. Here we go. But my neighbor, yeah. he's not going up. The one across the street, I never talked to him about the Lord, but he's, he's still down here. There were people I, I, the Lord laid on my heart. To talk to and I didn't talk to them about the Lord and they left behind. It ought to be our burden to take as many people as we possibly can to heaven with us. Amen. Amen. Oh, as many people as possible. That's our burden. That's why the church exists. Amen. That's our commission. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel.
Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for the many ways that you show what is a real church. God, help us today to be the kind of church you want us to be. Help us, dear Lord, to be the kind of Christians we ought to be. To support our church, to love our church, to, to be faithful to our church. Because, Lord, this is the house of God, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. And, Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, there's some today who are not in church. They're not a member of the church anywhere. God, would you show them how important it is that they be a part, not only of God's family, but a part of the body, a local body of Christians. And we ask these things in Christ's name. With heads bowed and eyes still closed, let's stand together. Candace is playing softly this morning.